Welcome to Mind and Soul Matters. In our last episode, clinical psychologist Dr. Laura Hedayati spoke about the role of forgiveness in healing. In today's episode, we share Charlie's inspirational story of forgiveness, courtesy of Baha'i Blog Productions and Sam Irwin Media. Video of today's episode is also available on Baha'iBlog.net. In 1971, Charlie Pierce left his home in the UK and took a post as a school teacher in Port Villa in Vanuatu. For over 40 years, Charlie dedicated himself to teaching in the small island nation. He forged enduring friendships and was widely recognised for his spirit of service to others, including being awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth for his services to education in Vanuatu. In 2012, however, Charlie was the victim of a brutal attack in his own home. This is Charlie's story. I was on my own in the house and I was awakened about three o'clock in the morning by stones being thrown at the window. And it's quite common in the urban areas of Vanuatu for robberies, for people to come and steal. You can never leave any clothes on the line because they will be stolen. (laughs) And we had been broken into a few times already, but not when we were there. People had come in, stolen things. And I just thought this was another group of one or two people wanting to break in, steal something, so I I shouted out, I think, go away, (laughs) I think, but they didn't, and it turned out this was a group of six people, now two of them, I found out later, were from the high-risk prison, they'd broken out of the prison. I got up and I saw at the window a faces and they said give us some uh, alcohol well a Baha'i doesn't drink so I knew that they didn't know they didn't know me they must have been people in prison so I said sorry I don't have any alcohol and he took a a thing that you um, shoot birds with a sling and fired a stone at my face Luckily, it just got me here, just above the eye. And then he said, OK, we want money. I said, I don't keep any money in the house. Back again, another thing at my face. And then the third one, he says, we want your laptop. I said, my laptop is not here. It's down at the teacher's college. I was being honest, always. And again, they fired at me. And I was now... As you can imagine, when you, when you have things at your face, a bloody mess here. And then I was a bit shaken by all this. And then suddenly the door, the front door, I don't know how they did it, but they smashed it open. And they all came in. And I was thrown on the floor. And they started ransacking the whole house and taking everything. And I, I could see that the the people that had come in were drunk and I suspected they were also on marijuana. They were not rational people. In the process of throwing me on the floor, I'd actually cracked or broken two bones here in the hip and I could hardly move. I was in agony. And then they, one of them said, look, we want you, we want the key to the car. I said, I don't know where it is, because they'd thrown everything everywhere. And they dragged me to the bedroom, and I remember this vividly. In the bedroom, I had this one particular person who was really aggressive. He put the knife at my throat here. I said, I'll kill you now. And then, I really don't know what happened. But suddenly, they all left. Maybe it was my prayers. And I was left in this shambles of a house, 
just like a hurricane had been through, everything all over the place, the glass everywhere. And I, I thought, I'm alive. I'm here, I'm, I, thank you God for protecting me. I'm, I'm alive. And I crawled on the floor, out of the door, across the road to my neighbor to ask for help. And this was about five o'clock in the morning, just as it was getting light. I was in hospital for a few days. I had many, many visitors non-stop. The students from the Teachers College, the young people from the Baha'i community, all my friends, everyone came non-stop. <laughs> and after a few days, I found that what had happened is that I had been very moved emotionally and that the moment I saw any conflict happening anywhere around me, I would have a meltdown. I was also physically not very well, and I managed eventually to come out of the hospital, come home, and gradually learned how to walk again, because I couldn't walk unaided. I was in a wheelchair, then, a, then on crutches and then eventually I could manage walking but I didn't recover emotionally at all. Charlie eventually moved to Australia but he could not stop thinking about the young man who had threatened to kill him. When I went back to Vanuatu I always thought well when I have a bit more courage I'll go and find this young man and Tell him that actually I forgave him the moment it, it happened because the people who were, were the aggressors were under the influence of marijuana and alcohol and they were not their normal. This was distorting their true personality and I thought no, they, I forgave them straight away. There was no bitterness in any way right from the start. And I wanted to go back and, and convey that to this person and help him to recover. But I couldn't, it was too difficult. And it took me four years before I could do that. And then when I was in 2016, four years later, I was in Port Vila, the capital, and I decided, no, I must make a, an effort now. I'm strong enough to face him again. And so I went and arranged for me to go to the back to the high risk prison the following week. I went on my own. I went with the correctional service people. We drove into the prison and I went into this container where they let you meet people. And they said, just wait. And he says, getting himself clean and he'll come and visit you and I I was really very nervous uh, how can I face somebody that actually wanted to kill me and I was waiting there just like this I, I was sitting there shaking a little bit and then he came in escorted by the guards and as he came in he was head was down and he was crying and I too was crying and then I just reached out my hands like this here and he reached out his hands and we touched and it was like electricity flowing between us it was a point of contact and we connected I was able to give him the four presents and each time I gave him the present he said I'm just so sorry for what I did and I said it's okay I forgive you this was a wonderful point of contact in the end we we hugged each other and we said we're brothers now we've made the connection and I, I always the prison the, the guards Afterwards, they said, how can you do that? We, we call ourselves a Christian country, but none of us could do what you have done and come in and forgive the person 
who was your aggressor? And I said, I have to do that. That's part of my belief, my identity as a Baha'i. That there was one important quotation that I was always was in my mind all the time. When a thought of war comes, oppose it by a thought of peace. A thought of hatred must be opposed by a more powerful thought of love. And with, with those feelings, of course I have to forgive and forget. And I, I think this was a very restorative process in that it certainly helped me to overcome the stress that I've been feeling, and I'm sure it helped him. It was probably the hardest thing I've done, and also the most wonderful thing that, that, that I've done. I think if we can all show forgiveness to each other, we forget any wrongdoing and we build the bridge that creates unity. And we, our society today, that's the one thing it needs at all levels, at the level of the family, the level of the village, the town, level of the country, and between, especially between countries and nations and that that's my identity as a Baha'i. I have to promote that. I'm not I have to, I want to promote that in everything. I think we have a, a duty to show love and compassion and forgiveness to everyone regardless of, of who they are. I, I think that's my message. Before I left Vanuatu and I wanted to, I, I composed a song to be sung by a string band and this was originally among, a, I, I had a group of youth, Baha'i youth that I was working with and we, we learned to sing that song and what it does is remind people in the chorus that if you serve others, if you put others before you in your needs, if you have a spiritual connection with God through prayer, then your inner light, your inner fire, grows. You become, you radiate the love of God, I guess, what it is. On the other hand, if you gossip about others, if you put your needs before them, me first, then your, your inner fire is dead. There's a lovely expression in Vanuatu when something goes wrong and people are suddenly finding that they're, they've lost their, their will. They say, fire blow me dead. I've lost my, uh, fire blow me dead. So I wrote the opposite. My song is, fire blow you light and your fire is light when you put others be before you. This was the song we wrote and these are actually expressing the Baha'i teachings. And then when I left the teachers college I decided that I wanted to leave a memory with all the students and so I worked together with a group of the teachers college trainees and we had this very wonderful string band that we performed on my farewell night.
my, my limited understanding is that we are material beings. We also have a spiritual identity. And this is our connection with, with God. And these two enable us to progress. If we don't have this one, and we are purely material beings, we become very selfish and self-centered. If we don't have this, we just have spiritual, we become ethereal, we become not connected with reality. We need the balance of the two. A very special thank you to Charlie Pierce and Baha'i Blog Productions. If you've enjoyed listening to Mind and Soul Matters, remember to share an episode with a friend and follow Mind and Soul Matters on social media. Look forward to your company next time on Mind and Soul Matters.